Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. For this entire month, we are looking at Advent, but we are also looking at a worship series talking about Come to the Table. And last month, we invited people to share their tables, and it has been really encouraging. We have gotten a few people to send in tables uh, from various places in their life that have meaning, and so we thank you. You can still share your table if you haven't. We are still welcoming those tables to be sent to us. So we want to welcome you to this space of Advent and inviting people to come to the table. I don't know if you've ever wondered, where do they get those scriptures from? How do they decide they're going to be in Isaiah? Just want to remind our listening congregation and community that there is something called the lectionary text. And a group of people decide and recommend that all pastors all over the world preach the same text. And so they are on what is called a three-year cycle. And so we are now in year A. Um, The church year begins with Advent. And we are now in year A. And then there's a year B. And then there's a year C. And then we cycle back again to year A. And sometimes those texts change. But this year they have us in the Gospel of Isaiah, which you heard read by Adam today. And we thank him for that reading. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you. Then once again, seven more days have passed and we find ourselves gathered in community. We found ourselves being invited to a table, a table of inclusion, Lord. We pray that we hear that we are blessed on today, that we are inspired, that we are encouraged, and that somehow your word and your path for our life becomes even more illuminated. Thank you. Thank you for this journey. In Jesus' name, amen. So the second Sunday, our part two, we're focusing on bench-pressing faith. Bench-pressing faith. I think I'm probably not alone when I say this. I don't like to work out. (laughs) I'm getting a few laughs in here, so maybe some of you can relate at home. But I remember in my younger days how health clubs would come to employment agencies and they would give these featured deals where you just couldn't say no. And I remember when Bally's came to my place of employment and they offered us deals and I went for the one with all the bells and the whistles, lifetime membership. Lifetime membership not only allowed me to go to the health club of my preference, but it allowed me to go to any health club I wanted to that was under Bally's. I could go in the suburbs. I could go while on vacation. I could go to any Bally's in the world. And so I signed up. And suddenly I was going to take on behavior that I hadn't really exhibited in the past. I suddenly was going to work out, as you've heard. I'm not really a fan of working out. But at the health club, there were different areas. In one area, there were a bunch of men that looked like junior incredible hulks, and they would be lifting all kinds of weights. And one of those weights was called bench press. That's where you lay flat on your back on a table, on a, on a, on a, like a table chair light, and you take these weights and you push them up. And I was always kind of impressed that some of them had quite a lot of weight and they would somehow bench press. The thing about bench pressing is it strengthens and endures and it increases your endurance in the upper part of your body. I would observe these men and they would add weights and they were increasing their strength and their endurance. Working out has never been all that much fun to me, but I convinced myself that it was good for me. It was good for my body. It was a good thing to do. I understood the importance of cardio, working out that cardio and that heart. I understood the importance of moving the body. And as I've gotten older and older, I really understand the importance of moving one's body. I would like to posit today that I think our faith is all about bench pressing. That by waiting and working and believing and blessing and proclamation and purpose, that we bench press our faith. 
For sure, we don't call on our faith when everything is going great, but we lean on it in uncertain times. Yesterday, I woke up and I did that tempting thing of grabbing my phone and looking at social media. And the first thing that was on there was I found out that my dear colleague in East Village, Manhattan, New York, that their church had literally burned down. This was a church that was declining in membership at one time and brought in a pastor to close the church. But a couple of decades later, they were thriving. He slowly turned things around. He went out into his community and talked to people. He caught the subway up to Harlem and talked to people and invited people. He invited a theater group into his church. And he got the, the old ladies in his church and the theater group people to get along. And he kept going out. He'd go to the bakery and get his sweet goods. And he would go out and he would continue to talk to people. And slowly the church turned around. And this church looked like it wasn't going to die after all. And he invited in his predecessor, Reverend Jackie Lewis. And today, Middle Collegiate Church has 1,500 members. They are a multicultural church and one of the most passionate spaces I've witnessed for the LGBTQ population. They attract Christians, they attract Jews, they attract Muslims, they attract atheists. Their worship is so dynamic, you think you've died and gone to heaven. So exciting is this space and this worship center. I joined them last night in lament. The grief was so heavy in the room. At 4.48 yesterday morning, a call was made to the fire department and they said within three minutes, the fire department was there. The building next door that was vacant because it had caught on fire in February of this year, somehow there was electrical wiring that started the building on fire quickly and that fire spread it over to the church. 100 firefighters were called and 198 worked to get this fire under control. But after they had really put the fire out, they concluded that the church was a total loss. The Tiffany stained glass windows totally destroyed. Right now they're trying to see if the oldest bell in the country, even older than the bell in Philadelphia. This newly renovated sanctuary, this church, this beautiful church is gone. The church was totally burned down to the ground and even the structure is unstable right now. They're trying to make sure that that does not crumble. So I joined together with members because this space meant something to me. My son at three months old and me got on a plane and entered this building for the first time and we had people to love us. This is a special place and right now there's a community and I cannot begin to imagine the depth of the loss and the grief of a church that you've come to behold burned down. And yet I joined this community of faith, our siblings. I saw people beginning to lean into their faith, to bench press their faith, to share incredible stories after stories of being isolated and lost and stumbling upon this place of inclusion and love. I listened to one lady who was on church share a beautiful testimony. As usual on Sunday morning with her little toddler, she would ask her little girl, what do you want to do today? And on this particular Sunday years ago, she asked her daughter, what do you want to do today? And her daughter said, I want to go to church. She was shocked. She was not religious. She didn't believe in God. She was not into church. Where did her daughter get such a notion to? But she was used to saying yes to her daughter. And so she said, yes, we'll, we'll go to church. And she got up and she got her daughter dressed and they went out. And she thought to herself, but to what church should I go? And what time is church? And then they heard the bell at Middle Collegiate. And she was like, I guess church is beginning. And she tried to explain to her daughter that church was a place where mean people went. She tried to prepare her daughter for the experience that she thought her daughter would have. And then they were swept into a church and they never left. Other people shared stories. 
similar to that. I imagine for this church, they will be exercising their faith. Faith is what we bench press and call on in uncertain times and in challenging times by waiting and working, believing and blessing with proclamation and purpose. We bench press our faith. In the text today, we find the Israelites who were no strangers to deep loss. In this text, it seemed like God had taken a break from them. And what is widely accepted as the beginning of 2nd Isaiah, chapter 40 begins a new era after a season of difference, of distance. This group exile in Babylon will come to an end and the people will be able to go home after living as foreigners in a hostile land. Last week, we perused there is deep loss and tragedy and brokenness of people here. I dare say they were running out of faith, but what little faith they had, they asked God for just a little bit of comfort. Opening this text, we hear the words deploring the heavenly council to bring comfort to this exiled people, consoling this distressed group. It is very, it is very likely during the journey that the Israelites had to bench press their faith. I know you've probably heard me say it, faith is not fun stuff. It calls on us to utilize everything we know and have experienced about God to show up in the space with us. Faith is what we lean into exactly when we want to run. We want to cry. We want to give up. Our faith is what holds our hand and say, we can do this. We absolutely can do this. We will rebuild. We will shine our light. We will be the church on the corner. We will talk to the strangers outside of our door. We will demonstrate that 11 a.m. does not have to be the most segregated hour. We will continue to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We will be the only institution on 53rd Street that does not look to get somebody to buy something from us, but to be a space who wants everybody to know how much God loves them. We will gather and we will worship even on Zoom and on Facebook and we will testify and we will share our stories of how God has brought us through and won't God do it again? Won't God do it again? We'll call on our faith, the faith of yesterday, for today in uncertain times to keep us. The Israelites were leaning into their faith. They were waiting for the God they had been told about that parted the Red Sea. They were waiting on this God. Imagine hearing about this God that brought their people out of Egypt and feeling totally like God is not with them. So often I hear faith being equated in some churches with magic. If you just have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can ask God for anything you want and God will give it. This week I happened to stumble upon Inside Edition and they were showing Reverend Kenneth Copeland who is like the godfather of prosperity. He has two jets, he travels around the world and has several properties. But I believe that faith is more than just asking God your list, giving God your list. I believe that faith is more than just asking God for what you want. Faith is work. Faith is bench pressing work. Faith is going to the Lord in prayer again and again. Faith is the spiritual discipline. Faith is that daily visit to the presence of the Lord's health club so that when the storms of, of life are raging, your faith keeps you from being blown away. Yes, we are challenged and we are stretched and we are sad and we are broken and we are tried, but our faith encourages us. The Israelites were waiting on God. They were seeking God's comfort. 
Sometimes when things get really bad, sometimes you just need a word of comfort. James Taylor words ring true today. When you're down and troubled and you need some love and care and nothing, nothing is going right, close your eyes and think of me and soon I will be there to brighten up even your darkest night. Y'all know this. You just call out my name and you know wherever I am, I'll come running to see you again. Winter, spring, summer, and fall. All you gotta do is call and I'll be there, I'll be there. You got a friend. Sometimes you need a word of comfort. Sometimes you need a friend. Sometimes you need someone to tell you, you're going to be okay. This is going to be okay. They needed to know they were still deeply loved by God, especially now in a time when so many feel the sharp pangs of isolation, that there is a connection that runs deeper than physical proximity, cultural sameness, and religious practice. Our faith is being bench pressed. It is natural in times of prolonged or acute crisis like exile or churches burning down or COVID for people to want some comfort. And in the text today, it says, comfort my people, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. It could say, comfort my speak people, speak tenderly to middle. Comfort my people, speak tenderly to united. Today, you see a table, another table, a different table from last week. And this table is a table that was given to us by Reverend Blair Hall. It is a table where Roger Dart, who was soon to be ordained, is standing around. It looks like a communion table. On this particular day, Roger Dart was to be ordained in his church. He was gathered there with his family and his church and his colleagues to participate in an ordination service and we can see that communion is happening, but Roger Dart is being invited to another table. He's being invited to a table to serve, to go out into the world and proclaim God's love. Reverend Roger Dart now organizes the CMA churches around disasters, and he helps with mission trips to Mississippi. And he is a voice that will not shut up for justice. He bench presses his faith daily. But this call to serve, this call to go out into the world is not just for religious leaders. It's not just for Roger Dart. Each of us, each of you are called and sent into the world. Every Sunday in our closing, in our benediction, what do we do? We send you forth. We send you like disciples. We send you into the world to bench press your faith. This is a special sending. John Lewis shares this story of his own bench pressing faith experience. There are about 15 kids outside playing and his aunt Seneva was in the house and they were out in the yard having a good time playing in the dirt and the sky began to cloud over and the wind started picking up and lightning flashed from afar off in the distance. And suddenly they weren't thinking about playing anymore. John Lewis recalls, I was terrified. Aunt Seneva was the only adult around with 15 kids. The sky blackened and the wind grew stronger and she herded them all into her house. And this house was not the biggest place around and it seemed even smaller with so many kids squeezed inside. Small 
and surprisingly quiet. All of the shouting and all of the laughter that had been going on earlier outside playing in the dirt stopped. The wind was howling now and the house was starting to shake and we were scared. Even Aunt Suniva was scared and that made me more scared, said John Lewis. And then it got worse. Now the house was beginning to sway. The wood plank flooring beneath us began to begin, began to bend. And then a corner of the room started to lift up. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. None of us could. The storm was actually pulling the house toward the sky with us inside of it. That was when Aunt Suniva told us to clasp our hands, to line up and hold hands, she said. And we did as we were told. Then she's had us walk as a group toward the corner of the room that was rising. From the kitchen to the front of the house, we walked. The wind screaming outside, sheets of rain beating on the tin roof. Then we walked back in the other direction as another part of the house began to lift. And so it went back and forth, 15 children walking with the wind, holding that trembling house down with the weight of our small bodies. More than half a century later has passed since that day, and John Lewis says, it has struck with me more than once over these many years that our society is very much like those children in that house, rocked again and again by the winds of one storm or another, the walls around us seeming at times as if they might fly apart. United and anyone listening, I hope you will lean into your faith, even though it's not fun. Let us call upon the Lord, but also let us call upon our faith. Let us share the stories about how God has brought us through so many times before. Let us shine our light because shining light shines best in uncertain times. Let us continue to hold each other's hands and encourage and comfort one another and walk to the sides of the house that we need to. A prayer, a card, flowers, a kind word can minister hope to someone struggling. Let us walk with each other to spaces. The wind is howling and threatening great damage. And let our faith remind us, even isolated and sheltered in homes, that we are still standing and that we are still very much called to be united in our faith. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, today we heard about churches burning down and we heard about houses being shaken. Our attention has been gotten. Help us to exercise our faith, even when it is not easy, even when we feel threatened by what we see. Last week, we were challenged to hold on to our hope. And today, we are challenged to embrace and press and lean into our faith for such a time as now. Amen. <laughs>